Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. The theme of our series is top-down faith. Top-down is usually usually has a negative connotation in business administration. Everything comes from the top down. They don't talk to the people who are affected by the new policies. Uh, of course, that's not what we intend to convey with this theme. The idea of top-down faith is that we have truths that come to us from the top down, <laughs> from God, that are so mind-boggling, uh, so amazing, that no human being could ever come up with this. Uh, remarkable, wonderful truth. And so every Sunday we look at one of these incredible truths from our great God that fill us with amazement and awe and joy. And today we're looking at the truth that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. From the tiniest beginnings come the most fantastic endings. Only God can do this. So we don't have the slides to be projected on the walls for you, so you will need to use the bulletin and open the hymnal. We're going back to the olden days, I guess. So, thank you. You may arise. We begin our worship with the name that was placed on us in our baptisms when we were adopted as God's dear children. The name we bear today as we gather to worship him. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth 
is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven, has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. God on high be glory and peace to all the earth. For God has shown his favor in Jesus' holy birth. Almighty God and Father, our humble thanks we bring. We worship you, we bless you, Lord God, our heavenly King. O Lamb of God exalted, you take all sin away. Extend to us your mercy and hear us as we pray. With God the Holy Spirit, at God the Father's throne, you reign, O Christ, forever, for you are Lord alone. The Lord be with you. We bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and bring forth fruits in faith, hope, and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The first reading is from Ezekiel chapter 17. It's not difficult to see why this Old Testament reading was chosen for the gospel, which talks about the kingdom of God being like a tiny mustard seed. Here we, ha here we have the illustration of a great cedar tree 
as a picture of the kingdom of God. This is what the Lord God says, I myself will take part of the tip of the cedar and plant it. From the topmost of its shoots, I will pluck off a tender sprig, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the high mountain of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches, bear fruit, and become a magnificent cedar. Flying birds of every kind will live under it. In the shelter of its branches, they will nest. Then all the trees in the countryside will know that I, the Lord, bring down the high tree and raise up the low tree, that I make the green tree dry up and I make the dried up tree blossom. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will carry it out. The word of the Lord. The psalm of the day is the very first psalm. The first three verses are about the godly man. The last three verses about the wicked man. And in the third verse, the godly man is compared to a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in every season. We draw our strength from the Lord and from his word, which empowers us to bear fruit throughout our lives. We'll read it responsively. How blessed is the man who does not stand on the path with sinners, but his delight is in the teaching of the Lord. He is like a tree planted beside streams of water. And its leaves do not wither. Not so the wicked. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Yes, the Lord approves of the way of the righteous. The second reading is from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Uh, this is one of four letters that Paul wrote during his first imprisonment. He was chained to a Roman soldier when he wrote these letters, 24 hours a day. And he speaks of how the gospel is bearing fruit throughout the entire world. And the church in Colossae is evidence of that. And he explains that Epaphras founded the church in Colossae. Paul was in Ephesians during his, excuse me, in Ephesus during his third missionary journey. And he spent three years there and many came to know the Lord. And Epaphras likely was a convert under the apostle Paul and he took the gospel 120 miles inland from Ephesus in present-day Turkey, and the church grew and flourished. Notice that God is able to use ordinary people like Epaphras to do extraordinary things. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. You have already heard about this in the word of truth, the gospel that is present with you now. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing in the entire world, just as it also has been doing among you from the day you heard it and came to know the grace of God in truth. You learned this from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. He is the one who told us about your love in the Spirit. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the gospel. 
grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel is from the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel, verses 30 to 32. Then Jesus said, To what should we compare the kingdom of God, or with what parable may we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is one of the smallest of all the seeds planted in the ground. Yet when it is planted, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest under its shade. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Dearly loved children of God, I'll admit that the text for today was a truth I learned as a child that I did not find particularly interesting. I remember sitting in class at Trinity Lutheran School in Crete, Illinois, and hearing the words, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, and I didn't get all excited about that. Uh, So a mustard seed is very tiny, and the kingdom of God is like that. But the Lord works on us, and he changes us, and he gives us experiences. And when this text became deeply meaningful to me, was especially when I served in the country of Nepal. Nepal is north of India, the size of Tennessee, 30 million people. It is incredibly beautiful. The Himalayan mountains cover most of the country. They pay a price for that beauty because mountains do not provide fertile soil to grow crops. So the people often don't have enough food. Along the southern rim of Nepal is a stretch of land about 20 miles wide. It is called the Terai. And the Terai are plains, and they have fertile soil. And that's where most of the food in the country is grown, but not enough to feed 
all 30 million people. When I was in Nepal, I saw these beautiful fields with yellow flowers. I didn't know what the plant was at first, and I soon learned they were fields of mustard seed. And the flowers of the mustard seed plant are the exact color of your yellow mustard. And they use it not only as a seasoning for food, but they make oil that they use for cooking from the mustard seed. And so I have seen endless fields of mustard seed in Nepal. There's one church that I visited a number of times in the country that is surrounded by fields. Most of those fields have mustard seed. We would walk on a dirt mound that was slightly elevated above the fields so that they could be flooded during the monsoon season and receive the moisture they need. And we'd walk to the church. This church was made of bamboo and had palm branches on its walls and on its roof. As people arrived, they all take off their shoes so at the door of the church are endless shoes everywhere. For them, it's disrespectful to wear shoes in a church. In fact, the few times we've had some Nepali Christians in America, if they're invited to say a few words after the service, they'll stop and they'll take off their shoes and they'll come up in their stocking feet which makes a bit of an impression on us Americans. Why are they wearing their socks up at the lectern? Anyway, as I sat down in this church, people started coming. And it didn't take long, but that church was filled, more than I can express, uh, wall to wall all the way to the front where the pastor stood. There were actually people sitting, everyone sits on the floor, with their face almost into the altar. I mean, that's how, I'm trying to sit there as tiny as I can, surrounded by people on every side of me. And then it came time for the offering and they pass a little basket for people who want to give rupees. Before the service, many bring garden produce from their fields. There's actually a big blue barrel to the right of the altar, and they put the garden produce in the barrel, and it was filled to overflowing. They had to set it down around the barrel. And then there's others who will give rupees. That's their currency, not dollars like we have. And so they pass this basket. And they have two teens handle this. Because it is almost mission impossible to walk through that church. Uh, you have to have incredible ability to somehow get around everybody and not lose your balance. Uh, it was glorious to be with God's people. All of these people are adult converts from Hinduism. They lost everything when they became Christians, ostracized by their village, by their families, uh, many hardships, and yet most will never think of going back because of the joy they have found in Jesus. That church, which was filled to the gills, I revisited sometime later, and they had built a brick facility, a single room laid out similarly to the first church. And I was there on a weekday, 
and they had the Sunday school children there, and they filled the church completely. I was there with a couple ladies from Lutheran Women's Missionary Society, and they all teared up as these Nepali children began to sing beautiful songs about Jesus. The church was growing more. And then I returned again. And now they had a bigger church, and it was actually in the shape of a cross this time. And at least for the time being, they were able to fit inside that church. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. From tiny beginnings come amazing endings. And I have to tell you how our work in Nepal all began. It's an incredible story. Um, a young man who had converted from Hinduism to Christianity, and he was a Brahmin, the highest caste in Hinduism. And when you're born a Brahmin, you have a golden spoon in your mouth. Doors just automatically open for you. You have advantages in every single area of life. But he gave up that those privileges when he believed in Jesus. And he lost it all. They kicked him out of his home. I told this story in another sermon, so I'm not going to go into any details now. But how did he become connected to us? Well, this is how it happened. He was on a bus, and there was a tourist from America who belonged to Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Madison. Maybe some of you know that church. It's an ELS church, which is in fellowship with ours. And the member on the bus started talking with this young man, and he happened to have one of our simplified catechisms, which we use often with the developmentally disabled. And he showed it to this Nepali, and he read it, and he was very impressed. Christian literature is exceedingly rare in this country. And he said, is there any way I can have more? Well, this member, thankfully, let his pastor, Bartles, know about this fellow he met on a bus in Nepal. And God bless Pastor Bartles, because he went and got one of our larger blue catechisms, and he went to the trouble of sending that all the way to Nepal. And now he was even more impressed, and he became connected with our world missions administrator, Dan Kelpeen. And he started to translate Christian literature into the language of Nepal. And they started sharing this literature, and it was like casting seeds. Well, when you throw the seed of God's truth out, guess what happens? There's a harvest. Souls are brought to the Lord. And this church, this mission began literally with two people. And today it numbers in the many thousands of people. It began in one place in far western Nepal. It now is present throughout the western third, is in the central part of the country, and is expanding into the eastern. So when I hear this, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The Lord, in his kindness, has given me these experiences where I have seen the tiniest beginnings lead to the most fantastic endings. And the churches there are continuing to grow by leaps and bounds. This is the power of God. This is the Holy Spirit. Now, what about us? You say, Pastor, you've been talking about Nepal. Well, we don't live in Nepal. We live in America. Well, you support the work in Nepal, big time. Thank the Lord. Well, 
it applies to you just as much. A mustard seed is 0.05 millimeters, okay? Uh, five one hundredths of a meter. If you divide a meter a hundred times and then you take five of those, that's what a mustard seed is. It's, you probably can't see this, but it's, it's about that big. Now, at one time, you were a fertilized egg in your mother's womb. And you know how big that was? One-fifth the size of a mustard seed. There was a time when you were smaller than a mustard seed, one-fifth the size. And look what God did. Huh? Really. The tiniest beginning. In baptism, God placed his name on you. I mean, talk about an indescribable privilege, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the who am I to bear that name, you know? I'm a sinner, but he loves sinners and he seeks the lost. And he placed his name on you and he made you his child. And more than that, your body became his temple. The Bible teaches this. Jesus lives inside you. You know the great temple that Solomon built, that magnificent facility, one of the seven wonders of the world? That was intended by God to be a picture of the Messiah who would live in the hearts of his people. What I'm trying to say is this, you're the real temple. Not that building Solomon made, seriously. You are the real temple. God lives in you. He works through you. Your whole life is a worship service. It's not just the hour that you are here. Every minute of your life is actually a worship service to God. You bear his name. He dwells inside you, and you glorify him as you love him and love your neighbor and share his word. Uh, and the Bible says that God has amazing plans for every one of our lives not just for that young man who was a Brahmin and who became a Christian, but for you. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, the first two verses we all know, for we are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one should boast. Uh, that shows us unequivocally that I am saved not by the work of these hands, but only by the nail-pierced hands of my Savior. I do not deserve his love. His love is unconditional. And then verse 10 goes one step further. For we are God's workmanship, his craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus, listen, to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. God has a blueprint for your life, seriously. And he knows what he wants to accomplish in you and through you. And he will do more than you can imagine. That's his promise. You may think, I'm too little, I'm too ordinary, I'm too insignificant. What can I do? No, no. You're forgetting the one who lives in you. You're forgetting the power of his truth. The seed of the gospel has 
brought a marvelous harvest of a soul in your life, and the Lord will use that to touch other lives. The epistle reading for today said, this gospel is producing fruit and growing throughout the world. Isn't that a glorious statement? It is in Nepal, it is in Eagle River at Christ Lutheran Church and in many other places. Uh, God used a man named Epiphras there to start that church. Epiphras uh, isn't somebody we know much about, but the Lord did great things through him. You might think that the only churches that would become big and strong were the ones Paul started, right? Wouldn't you think that way a little bit? Must be one Paul began. No. God uses those of lesser gifts to show that the power is of God and not of man. See? He delights in using little people like you and me, to carry out his will. So trust in him, trust in the power of his word, and he will do more than we can imagine. I'll close with these words from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, which put the cap on this message about the kingdom of God having the tiniest of beginnings and the most wonderful endings. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, be honor and glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Okay. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now we'll confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Please arise for that confession of faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We appreciate you filling out the care cards, which help us care for the many souls that are part of the family of God here at Christ. Thank you.
Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Lord Jesus, teacher and friend, fill the members of our congregation with a deep love for your word and a desire to hear and learn it. Strengthen and defend your church so that the seed of the gospel will continue to bear fruit in a wonderful harvest of souls. Merciful God and Father, mindful of your great compassion, we implore you to turn the hearts of all who have forsaken the faith they once embraced, have wandered from it, or are in doubt about your truth. Restore them that they may once again take great pleasure in your word. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Lord God, we pray for our brother in Christ, Marv Radloff, who is undergoing treatment for cancer. We ask that if it is your will, that you will grant him healing. We pray that you will give him strength in times of weakness and peace with any anxiety he might feel. Remind him that he does not walk alone, but that you are always there at his side and that you will never leave him. We commend to you our many brothers and sisters who are being tested by trials of various kinds and ask that they will find in you their refuge, their comfort, their peace. Hear us, Lord, as we now pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and host of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our voice 
voices cry, Hosanna, Lord, hear our humble plea. In mercy come and save us, in love come set us free. Hosanna in the highest, how blessed is Christ our King, who died as our Redeemer, eternal life to bring. How blessed are you, Lord Jesus, now coming in God's name. Hosanna in the highest, our grateful hearts proclaim. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear us, O Father, as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We ask that those who are members of Christ or in fellowship with the church body, in fellowship with our Wisconsin Synod, come to receive communion. We want you to understand what you're receiving. If you're not, please talk with 
the pastor and we'd be happy to explain things in the hope that you could commune. So come for all things are now ready. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, I'll say the next prayer, then you'll say the Amen, and then you'll see Luther's morning and evening prayer. Since this is the afternoon and evening is approaching, we'll use the evening prayer at that point. We'll say it together. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in saying the evening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins, and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe 
may have no power over me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. It's great to be with you this afternoon. I don't have any special announcements. There are many people listed with the prayers in the bulletin, so you will want to keep them in your prayers. Some are going through some difficult trials, so it's a longer list than we normally have. So I wish you God's peace this night. The Lord bless you. Thank you. Thank you.